Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been given the difficult task of trying to make up time for us. And for every minute I make up, Dr. Brian Robinson, I'm going to invoice you. Um, after being approached with doing this topic on sustainability leaderships, leadership and the principles to encourage new behavior, it allowed me to reflect on my own journey as a leader. As uh, Brian has given it away, I used to work for a beverage manufacturing company and my Um, if we look at what Andrew Taylor said in an article he wrote in February of 2020, he refers to sustainability leadership as a process of influence that delivers direction, alignment, commitment, and aims to address social, environmental, and economic issues to create a better world. And obviously, he quoted the different people you see up on the screen. So let's agree that's the the definition of reference as we go through our engagement today. Coming back to the issue of, of at hand of the principles to encourage new behavior. I think first and foremost, for me, awareness, leadership, and creating a culture are quite critical. I think the previous speaker, just on the last Q&A, there was a huge discussion about culture. But before we get to culture, the awareness talks to having a perspective and discernment on your relationship with the different parts of being a business leader, be it the environment you operate in, be it the people, suppliers, society, and even future generation and legacy building issues. Your own self-awareness on sustainability will shape and drive the decisions you make as a leader from a personal perspective and also at a business level. Once this is done and you are aware and you understand the role that you play in relation to all these other different systems around you. It's to reflect on how the decisions you make in business impact and touch on all these different aspects. Then once you've had a level of awareness and decide on how you're going to impact all these different elements, it's also about how will you lead and create a lasting culture. The previous CEO was speaking was asked around how are you going to make sure when you leave and you move on, whatever you've implemented is lasting and stays on even into the future? And this is where creating a lasting culture in sustainability leadership also becomes important. How do you create a culture that is not dependent only on you to drive the sustainability ag agenda, but the wider organization through shared accountability and action? When it comes to creating a culture that puts sustainability at the core of its competencies and at the core of its business, companies have had to rely on mechanistically driving compliance. However, if sustainability in an upfront and decisive manner is weaved into your business model and the DNA of the organization, it becomes a bit easier to practice sustainability leadership. Then the second principle to drive new behaviors that I'd like to talk to is influence over authority. 
Sustainability leadership requires a collective effort. It can never be a one-man show. It also requires collaboration and networking across different spaces. And in some cases, you don't own those spaces, you don't have authority in those spaces. Therefore, positional power becomes less important and influence, lateral leadership, even managing upward becomes much more important. Sustainability efforts that business will engage in will include a collection of very diverse stakeholders. Sustainability leadership is less about the person or the position, but more about the influence you have on the sustainability interventions you're involved in and the stakeholders that you engage with. This is where I wanna bring in, I think what this conference or leadership summit is hinged on skills for leaders to deal with some of the business issues that we're facing. When it comes to sustainability leadership, like I said, it is less about position and more about the skills to be able to negotiate, to be able to influence, to be able to collaborate, to be able to partner, to be able to sponsor, and even to some degree to manage opposing agendas. And when you find yourself in that context, your position and your authority has very little to do with it. The third, and I think one of the most important principles, and I think it's at the core of everything, is interconnectedness. And this principle is also closely related to the first principle of awareness. It is critical to come to an awareness very, very quickly, as a leader, as an individual, as a business and come to terms with the fact that business does not operate and exist in a vacuum, but it is part of a greater ecosystem that includes people, that includes the environment, that involves socio-economic issues and multiple other systems. It is important to note that the principle of interconnectedness should not only be an issue of proximity and distance, but there should be a global resonance to understanding interconnectedness. I think COVID has taught us a great lesson that we should have learned a long time ago. No business, no person, no country, no organization was insulated away from what was happening when we experienced COVID. The impact on the whole sustainability agenda, be it profit or people or the planet was felt. Employers suddenly had to deal with a loss of revenue, loss of lives of their own employees, mental health issues at work as a result of people having been impacted by COVID. And we had to come up with new ways of working. In my personal opinion, COVID was and is the icon for interconnectedness and the ripple effects that different things can have on each other. The systems, people, policy, laws, and even at a country level. Joel, John Elkington wrote, the people, the planet, and the profits are inter-reliant. Society depends on the economy, and the economy depends on the global ecosystem, whose health represents the ultimate bottom line. Then that brings me to my fourth principle that I think is quite important, encouraging uh, new behaviors towards sustainability leadership, having a global and a generational approach. And I think the previous speaker touched on this as well um, uh, through the Q&A session. It is not only about proximity, as I said, and it is on not only about where you are right now. I covered the topic of having a global approach well under the interconnectedness principle. And now I'd like to cover more on having a generational perspective to your sustainability efforts. What is the legacy you wish to leave behind that is born out of your responsibility you must take now for future generations? What does a sustainable tomorrow look like for your organization, for your industry, for your employees, for your environment and your communities? What decisions are you making or not making that are gonna impact future generations? So your sustainability agenda interventions and efforts need to be forward looking. It can't be just about how do I survive the now? It's got to think about future generations to come. The fifth principle I'd like to cover 
is related to networking, partnering, and collaboration. As I've alluded to earlier, the sustainability agenda has a lot of moving parts and a lot of stakeholders. Identifying the right networks, partners, and having a collaborative approach goes a long way in making sure we win in our sustainability journey. Let us look at an issue closer to home in Qabekha. We currently have a water crisis. It will take industry, it will take government, it will take society, it will take the citizens to manage this crisis. The results would not come from one party, but a joint collaborative effort due to the interconnected nature that the crisis presents. And finally, but not um, least important, it's to embrace complexity and evolution as you lead in your sustainability journey. We cannot get away from the fact that the world is in a constant state of flux and change. The change patterns that leaders, uh, business leaders, society must deal with are now at an exponential rate. Change a couple of decades ago was a little bit preemptive. You could kind of work out what's going to come. We did not see what happened in the last two years coming. The nature of the changes have also brought about complexity. And it is to this end that sustainability leaders must make sure we are comfortable and embrace those changes, the rate of the change, and the complexity presented by the change. Once again, I think a good example of this is COVID and the responsiveness and the agility that as a people, as a government, as civil society, as businesses, have had to demonstrate in order to sustain through the difficult times. I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer to home and to my place of employment and my business, the Isuzu South Africa business. Um, we are not boasting and we are not saying we are perfect, but we want to share with you how we might have consciously or subconsciously applied some of these principles in our business to drive our sustainability agenda. Just a quick history, um, Isuzu Motors South Africa, um, we've got facilities in Strandale, a couple of plants and also subsidiaries that sit in Strandale from the production plant for our DMAX vehicle, um, our drivetrain business, uh, we've got Isuzu Finance and Mobility and also a commercial bodybuilding business. We've got about three products in our stable and that have evolved over time. We've got a great deal of partnerships. We've got 84 dealers um, across Africa and 33 of them sit in my territory that I'm responsible for. We've got 508, 518 direct and indirect suppliers. And in terms of employment, we directly employ about 1,031 and indirectly we impact from a labor perspective 25,000 25, people. And I think as you can see, the interconnected nature of our business says it's got to be a strong principle that we firstly are aware of and secondly understand how to manage. In terms of history, our first product was launched in 1964 and as things evolve and as change happens in the world, you also have to align as a business along with those changes and make sure you're able to cope with them. It takes us now to 2022, where we launched our recent DMAX vehicle, our seventh generation. And that seventh generation vehicle takes into account the complexities in the world and the evolution in the world, especially when it comes to sustainability. How we've designed the product and what the product does from an environmental perspective is also reflective of that. This is the Isuzu Motors um, um, leadership team. I didn't put it up there to really concentrate too much on what people do. I'm just putting it up there as a reflection. The look of Isuzu South Africa leadership has evolved and transformed over the years. This had to do with, uh, this had to be done to evolve and align with our country's evolution in terms of labor laws and, and regulation. Just a year ago, this picture was completely, completely different. However, our CEO, Billy Tom, 
in his awareness and in his conviction to drive transformation, still here, to drive transformation in our business, he made a concerted effort to make sure that our leadership mimics the requirements that our country has from a representation point of view. He has a lot more work to do because I'm the only lady there and I remind him of this every single day. If we move on to the Isuzu Moto strategy, it's not to really see the details of the strategy, but once again, our business cannot be conducted in a vacuum and we are not in a bubble. Even our strategy we've set, um, even in the strategy we've set, it is quite clear. In our mission, we recognize the link to our customers. In our priorities, we recognize the link to our people. In our vision, we recognize the links to our suppliers and our customers, the environment and communities. Our strategy talks to the interconnected nature of things and having to manage all moving parts in a sustainable and balanced manner. If we look at things from a leadership perspective, awareness and culture, and having a global and a generational approach. A clear leadership decision was taken at a strategic level by the president of Isuzu Japan to include ESG as a core pillar in our midterm business plans. There is also a global approach and an awareness of this global resonance to what we do in the sustainability space. Moving on closer to home, this is Billy Tom, my boss. Hopefully he's not in the room and I don't know. <laughs> Once again, a clear demonstration of the interconnected nature of things and also leadership and awareness and creating a culture. He's had, he set, had to set the culture and the tone from the top by leading from a front in terms of sustainability matters, as seen in his statement that he put out, that for any business, growth is at the core of its future and developmental plans. Our goal is that our business remains sustainable while we seek to have a positive impact on our full value chain, inclusive of employees, dealers, suppliers, customers, and our community. Also to drive the culture and to make sure that systemically sustainability is driven at the forefront of our business. And it's not just about Billy leading everybody with the stick in terms of sustainability. We've gotten a structured uh, um, approach in terms of sustainability reporting. We understand what the expectations of our stakeholders are. We ensure expectations are given due consideration in decision making, and we, we respond in a reasonable, um, we respond to reasonable stakeholder expectations and concerns. And we also drive for independent facilitation and auditing of our sustainability interventions. The focus areas in our business, I think as I said, a couple of years ago, the list for ESG focus was probably much smaller than this. However, with evolution and complexity of our society, a couple of other things have made it to the list. Specific to our company, we concentrate on governance issues. We concentrate, which is the previous topic that EOH covered, uh, we concentrate on environmental initiatives, human rights, communities and society, and quality initiatives, as well as supply chain management, including localization efforts to make sure that when we manufacture our vehicles in Kebeha, we increase the amount of local content. Us increasing the amount of local content in our vehicles translates to a huge positive impact in terms of our environmental footprint. Also to note that Isuzu Motor South Africa managed to reach a level one triple PE um, score in 2021, which is something that we pride ourselves in because it indicates that we're also very serious about transformation in all spheres of our business. Just to take you through a couple of initiatives that we've been involved in, um, specifically talking to environmental performance in the last couple of years, it's been a lot of complexity and a lot of evolution and we've tried to keep up with it. We've also been very intentional about being aware of how we are interconnected to our environment. Water conservation efforts 
have managed to deliver a 47% improvement. And this is critical, especially with us operating a plant outside of Grebecha and the current water crisis that we face. In terms of energy conservation, we've shown a 27% improvement. And from a climate change perspective, we've had a re reduction of up to 22% on our VOC emissions and also a reduction of 20% on our CO2 emissions. From a waste perspective, um, if we benchmark ourselves in terms of the hierarchy of waste, we've had a couple of um, achievements on this front. Um, from a reuse perspective, we've had a 25% improvement from 2018, where we've got up to 90 kgs only um, per unit of waste reused. We've got 97% recycling ratio as IMSEF, and our energy recovery um, is up to 10 kgs per unit, and we are currently landfill free as a business, which is quite an achievement. Then I want to switch quickly to our conservation initiatives. Um, I think another point that is important here, which is what the topic of the summit is hinged on, is around skilling and leading. We've had to bring in the skills to be able to help us deliver on our sustainability agenda. We recently brought in, brought in a senior manager who's going to help us with sustainability. His name is Thule, and he played a good part in putting this presentation together. We've got botanists that we've brought in, which is why we can do interventions such as this. We recently planted um, 800 speck bombs um, in our plant uh, in 2021. And I don't know how much of you uh, know the speck bomb plant, but the speck bomb plant is one of those plants in SA that has got the ability to absorb CO2 better than any other plant. It's also edible, by the way. In terms of community involvement, interconnectedness to our communities and the educational facilities in the spaces where we operate is important. The students in these facilities will become future employees and will be faced with making sustainability decisions. And this awareness is critical in terms of how we approach our involvement and the decisions we make now. We've been involved in adopting a school program because we realize that our future labor force is going to come from these schools. We've been involved in a chemical reuse project in some of the schools because we know those kids in the future are going to understand sustainability and are going to have to make sustainability decisions. In terms of private-public partnerships, which brings me to the principle of networking, partnering and collaboration. We went into a project where we had to collaborate with our competitors, the likes of Ford, our suppliers, our government and other stakeholders, and we don't have the authority over them. And this is where we had to practice influence and also demonstrate championship. And we did a cleanup of New Brighton with all those different stakeholders, and I think it was a very good effort on our end. And then I think lastly, I could not talk about complexity and evolution and interconnectedness without talking about our efforts that went into helping um, with the disaster response to COVID and also the recent floods that we saw in KZN. We donated a couple of our vehicles to Gift of the Givers to be able to continue their work they do across the country. Um, we also were involved in the refurbishment of a health facility also within this municipality to be able to accommodate uh, people who were impacted by the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic as well. And of recent, we also got involved in cleanup efforts and providing earth moving equipment to deal with the crisis that we see in KZN from an environmental perspective and how they've been impacted about the floods. And like I said, we are not perfect, but these are some of the things that we are doing as an organization to drive the sustainability agenda. And in some of the efforts, we are conscious in the principles they apply. And in some of them, I think we are unconscious. But however, it still moves that sustainability agenda forward. Thank you.